Welcome to I Am Weekly. I'm Pamela Anjay. Today's edition is a very important one, particularly for immigrants of African descent and minority communities, because most of us are not in tune with the civil rights movement, nor post-civil rights era. My guest today is someone that has studied the relationship between slavery, the civil rights movement, and where we are today in civil rights. Host, I want to introduce Dr. Renaldo Ortiz Minaya, whose areas of research reflect colonization's indelible impact on his land of birth and on surrounding islands. He was born in the Dominican Republic, and he's gonna share with us the implications of what movements like the BLM, Black Lives Matter movement, and other struggles that our Black revolutionary leaders fought for. Before I bring him to the show, I want you to do me the honors, clicking on the subscribe button if you're not subscribed yet, liking us so that YouTube will share our videos, and of course, ringing the notification bell so that you will be notified when this interview is released. This is very important because our children, especially children of immigrants, might get caught up or some are already getting caught up. How can we avoid the pitfalls of an over-policed society, an over-penalized society, where the target is children of color and black kids? Don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Herman Chang and like us on Facebook at The Immigrant Magazine. I have two boys, I have a husband, I have brothers, I have friends in our society. We came here seeking better opportunity, but what we met, an opportunity and trouble. How can we avoid them? Let's welcome Dr. Ortiz to the show. So welcome to the show, Dr. Ortiz. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I cannot tell you how excited I am about this particular conversation that you and I are about to have because as immigrants, you know, most of us are not even in tune with what the civil rights movement was about. We're not in tune with what our, you know, fellow Americans or African-Americans or people of color endured. And uh, not to mention the period of enslavement, you know. And so we come here because we're seeking better opportunities. And then we somehow all of these movements are happening. BLM is happening. They're constantly protests. Al Sharpton is on the streets. And you're just wondering what's going on. Mm. You know, so I really want us to talk about that and how we can avoid getting caught up. You know, how do we participate without necessarily, you know, standing out in a way and, you know, to protect our children who are born here, especially, you know. Mm. So you have studied that enormously, the relationship between the penal system and all of those movements, right? Yes, indeed I have. So, so um, what immediately comes to mind, uh, Madame, is, is a few things. Number one, um, there, there's, I'm a historical sociologist, so I tend to look at uh, phenomena in society from both a local regional perspective, but then in a much global perspective, no? And when, when I myself am an immigrant, as you well know, no? And a lot of the times when immigrants go from one place to another, it, it is indeed a, a very um, turbulent, Psycholo psychologically uh, demanding transition because one has to first uh, gain control of oneself, but then also think about the future as one children and then figure out what is going on in society, you know? And, and a lot of the times when it comes to immigrants, immigrants because of the mere fact that they are immigrating end up living in the same areas, the same communities as the very same people from that country that they're going to that are victims historically of discrimination, racism, and economic inequalities, no? Um, so, so in that regard, it's, it's extremely uh, a huge burden onto our parents of trying to figure out how do I secure the best for my children and for my offspring? And at the same time, I'm one trying to make sense of what's going on around me. And the very first uh, example of that is simply language, no? Mm -hmm. So in my case, my parents didn't speak a lick of English. And to this day, and we're talking about 40 years after the fact of immigrating to the United States, they're still calling me and asking me, 
listen, I need your help to translate this letter that I received in the mail. I don't know what it says. Can you help me make a phone call? No. And then you switch over to the children. The children are betwixt and between. It's a particular term that we have that, that in the, for example, in the context of Latinos, you're definitely not white in the United States of America, no? But in the context of who is defined as quote unquote black in the African-American sense, you're not black. So if you're a young person, you're like, okay, so I'm not white, I'm not black, so what am I, no? So where do I fit in? So identity is a very important issue when it comes to young people who are either coming to the US already from other societies or born in the US and they're trying to find a, a sense of who they are, where they belong. And then they're smacked in the face with the identity structures that are in the United States, no? And that only adds more complication. Um, right now in the United States, and I would even say globally, it's a hotbed. Everybody knows that, that the United States um, right now has a lot of racial unrest, a lot of economic unrest. And the question is quite honestly, dot 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 what's going to happen next no um and 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 from a sociological perspective we very well know um we are right now in the spring of 2022 in the next few months we might see concern uh conditions that might lead to a ticking time bomb for the summer social unrest across the country always tends to happen massively during the summer moments, during the spring moments, and then they tend to die out little by little. So, so in a nutshell, I, I would say that it's, it's a very difficult process because at the same time, our, our youth force our parents, and I'm including myself in this, to kind of try to figure out and make sense of, of how are they going to balance? And that balance is very hard. The balance of becoming quote unquote American but at the same time, retaining one's culture. Because I'll give you another example. When immigrants go back to their respective countries, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Cameroon, Venezuela, the offspring are considered sort of less than of Cameroonian or Dominican because they, they've been raised in an American way, no? So, so that only adds to the complication. Um, I can tell you that the work that I do is I specifically study the different forms of the ways in which African people, people of color, and individuals who are deemed as racially inferior are actually discriminated against, punished, and they're, they're basically set out generationally to be victims of whatever system of control exists in that country. In the United States, we went from slavery to Jim Crow to the ghetto to the prison. The okay. question is, which is the next form of institutional control that African Americans, Africans, people of color are going to be subjected to in the context of the United States? And what can people who are challenging that actually do to, to stop that kind of continuance? That is just amazing what you've just said. And I've always wondered, because you know, if you look at the Latin the Latino community, the Latin heritage, people of Latin heritage, they also have, it's not homogenic, right? Correct. Afro-Latinos and you have, I don't know what the different, they have their own nuances and differences. However, there's, there's gotta be a strong connection between that rapport and the African-American heritage, which is a little different from maybe now the African from the continent. Correct. Correct. About and I think, yeah. Yes. So, so, so the, in the context of the U.S., no, because we can shift the conversation and also um, apply the very same exact question in relation to, say, for example, individuals from the British West Indies who then go on to England, and then the relationship between West Indians and Britons who are of black phenotype is similar. But in the context of the United States, a lot of that has to do, number one, with the geographical proximity between the United States and the Spanish Caribbean and Central America. Um, unfortunately, uh, in terms of colloquial understanding, there's a lot of ahistorical and completely incorrect uh, history 
as to the relationship between Afro-Latinos, which is a term that's quite uh, late in terms of the way it's used, but, there, but there's been a long standing history and interaction between La Caribbean peoples of African descent, because the term Afro-Latino doesn't even exist outside the US. The don't term Latino- it should, it should, don't you think it should because they actually are there and they've been there. Yes, but, but the irony is that in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, there is, it, it's, it's, it's a very multifaceted component because in the Caribbean, the term Afro-Latino wouldn't necessarily apply because the assumption is that if you're from the Caribbean, there's no way to deny the fact that you're part African, unless you want to be in a bubble or the other one too, you have a lot of Latinos who want to deny that they're African, they want to deny that they're black. And they have a little bit of a wake up call when they get to the United States, when, they, <laughs> when they're told, no, wait a second, you might be white in the Dominican Republic, but you're not white in here, so wake up, no? Ooh. So so, so that's one component. Another component too is that in the context of the United States, whether it's Cuba or Puerto Rico, um, there's been a long standing US, well in the context of Puerto Rico, they still are a colony of the US. They are still part of the US territory, no? In the context of Cuba, there's there's the the relationship between Cuba and um, particularly Afro-American life is intimately, intimately connected. I'll give you a perfect example. The name of Antonio Maceo, he's considered one of the preeminent uh, lieutenant generals of the Cuban Independence Army, lived throughout the late 19th century uh, and died in 1896 in battle. And the term Maceo during that time frame became a very important name within US African American culture to the extent that you have a lot of individuals naming their children Maceo after this particular Afro-Cuban Lieutenant General. So I would push people to actually historically do the work to uncover the intimate ties that exist between African people in the Caribbean that are Spanish origin and African Americans in the US. In New York, the most common example of that is Arturo Schomburg, a black Puerto Rican that to this day, the Schomburg Center for Black Research and Culture in Harlem is named after a black Puerto Rican. Yes. Well, I think what we call black heritage or should be really African heritage and we should include all these names, these people, these revolutionary people that you just named, you know, yes. because, um, the experience, um, it's typically been from the African-American perspective, mm -hmm. right? It's not diaspora. Correct. Yeah, Correct. I diaspora. completely agree with you. And, and I think there, so, so uh, unfortunately, as you know, I travel the world for my research and, and there's some, there, there's two things I would like to point out. Number one, there's something that I call linguistic imperialism in the sense that a lot of the times we need to be very careful as to the terms that we use. So for example, it is very common for individuals to say America and they only are referring to the US when America is a whole continent. But the flip side of that coin is that when they refer to Africa, they refer to Africa as a country when it's a continent. So, so in other words, you, you reduce an entire continent to one country in the, in the America, and you do the very same thing with the continent of Africa. That's extremely problematic, right? But if we dig deeper, in the context of the U.S., one of the hardest things uh, uh, in the U.S. is to have us permanently keep in mind, we have to expand our imaginary to understand that certain terms may only be applied in the space that you're in, but they may not apply elsewhere. So because of that, when you say, okay, what does it mean to be black? Well, the term black doesn't really exist outside of the US in the same way that it exists in the US, no? Yes. So what words can we use that are approximate to the realities to another country, whether it's Liberia or South Africa, or say the Garifunas in Honduras. And I think in that regard, we forced ourselves to be more globally conscious of understanding the ways that race operates in different ways. You know, you just said something. In, 
about the Afro Latino experience in the Caribbean, it doesn't really, the term doesn't exist. No. Just like in Africa, and I speak for Cameroon, I didn't grow up thinking of myself as black. I just am. Yeah, correct. I just am. And then I come to the United States, I am it, I'm reminded that I'm black. <laughs> you know, I am reminded. But tell me, this linguistic, that if you call it linguistic imperialism, right? Mm -hmm. How does it then affect us in the system that we exist? Because that is, that is, that is, there's a reason for that. I yes, think. By, by, by all means. I think, I, I think that, you know, first of all, I would argue that it, it limits our ability to understand how these particular systems operate at the international and global level, number one. And when it does that, it unfortunately then uh, uh, shapes or more like contains our imaginary ability to th think about solutions and possibilities and strategies to solve our problems, no? And, but at the same time, it also gives individuals who are looking to control people a much easier silent way to do that because there, there's something that we call uh, uh, the, 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 the liability of culture. When people always want to say, okay, well, you know what? Um, this particular culture, this is the way that they do it. But in reality, their, their interpretation of what culture is becomes a handicap to be able to understand it on a, on a much broader level. And I think, unfortunately, uh, there's been pockets of that reality in the United States. And it's not necessarily just for the quote unquote black African-American perspective, I would even say for quote unquote whiteness, because in the terms of whiteness in the US, there's an ugly history when it comes to the first experiences of the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, the Polish, that all of a sudden, now there's this sort of common practice that whites say, well, I'm just white or I'm just American. But my question to them would be, well, no, let's go back. Let's, let's start peeling the layers. And at some point, you must have came across the pond, whether that was Ukraine or Poland or Italy or whatever the case may be, no? So in that regard, unfortunately, the way we speak about race is very limited, is very ahistorical, meaning that there's like some historical specificities, but more importantly, the way it operates on a normal basis, no? On a day-to-day -day basis. In, in, in the United States, I'm clearly a Latino man of color, no? I'm here in Jamaica. I am repeatedly being told that I am a white man in Jamaica. <laughs> and, and, and they make it very well known. No, they make it very clear. No? That, that, is so funny. that is so funny. In the United States, they're like, oh, your color, you know? Yes. And over there, you're white. I am white. I am <laughs> definitively white. Yes. And you indeed. know, and like you said, it does affect how we're treated. It does affect how we operate. Um, yes. For a student of history and history does inform our present. You, you talked about the period of enslavement. You talked about the period of Jim Crow and all of those things. And today, where do you think, what do you think we are doing right now? Where are we going? What do you foresee that we need to be watchful of? I, I think we need to be extremely and critically watchful of the use of technology and what we're calling e-surveillance, no? Uh, because unfortunately, around the world, it's not the U.S., the, the, under the guise of technological advancement, no? Um, I think technology is being played with around to see to what extent it will be used as either a sole component of control or to accompany another form of control. Wow. A lot of the states in the United States right now are increasing their usage of ankle bracelets. They're increasing their usage of GPS monitoring, no? What does that do? That actually... Uh, and, and, and the irony of this, which is if you take a moment to break it down, individuals, some states are letting people go. That is very clear. Some states are decreasing the amount of people in prison, but those very same states are increasing the usage of ankle bracelets. And the individuals who are released, they are responsible for to pay the monthly bill on the ankle bracelet that the state is using to monitor them. Now, mind you, they went into the prison system for engaging in criminal activity for not being able to survive financially. 
they go into the prison system, they exit the prison system, and now they have to pay a bill. And if they do not maintain that payment, guess what? They go right back into the prison system. My goodness. You know, I did not know that when you wear the ankle bracelet, you are responsible for paying for that. Yes, you are. And guess who the majority that are incarcerated? Black and brown. Make no mistake Everybody. about that. Yeah. And, and, and so it's, that's part of the... And so look at the irony of this as mm -hmm. well. A lot of individuals were rightfully pushing for a decrease of the numbers of people in the prison system. And the United States in some states has definitely decreased. But at the same time, looks were coming back around, you know? So it's like you, you eliminate one form, but you actually substitute it for another form, you know? So yeah. I, would, I would definitely argue that we need to be mindful of the usage of technology for the next form of institutional control that will be imposed upon Black and African and people of color in the United States. So Dr. Ortiz, what are we to do though? Because now we have movements like the BLM, mm -hmm. we have protests all the time. Are we focusing on the wrong thing or should we be doing all of those simultaneously? Because I bet you most people don't know about what you just shared with me. Um, I think that, that first and foremost, we have to understand that a lot of the times the, 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 the activism, the work that we put in into trying to make society a better place, we also have to be very conscious and ask ourselves historically, look at previous examples. So we look, for example, at the civil rights movement. Our four parents gave their lives, most of them were murdered, and to make society a better place in the US. But then if we look at, for example, the rates of educational discrimination and segregation in, in the United States, they're supposedly, according to research, either worse than what they were during the height of Jim Crow, or if not somewhat equal. In the context of the BLM and what we, what we see going on right now, I would, I, I would share that first and foremost, be, be aware of what you're asking for and what you're pushing for, but at the same time, study history to see what happened previously that you might learn to see, is it really changing the structure or is it just changing the form of that structure? And that's two different, totally different things, no? I'll give you a perfect example. What's going on in the US, I'm foreseeing something. In the US, we're gonna start seeing a complete 180 as to this discussion about police brutality and defunding the police because no now- know that. Yes, yeah. because actually what's happening now, if you study the rhetoric in the media, now the police is being painted as victims and the police is being painted as the ones who are subject of the failure of society to honor, respect rule of law to the extent that President Biden proceeded on to New York and to gave the New York City, uh, the New York City mayor full support of the federal government. And it's not about defunding the police. Biden explicitly argued to fund the police even more. And to be honest with you, Madame, it's a very, depending who I'm speaking to, I'll be very careful as to how I answer that question because you cannot tell young people not to fight. You cannot tell young people not to challenge the situation. Mm -hmm. But I would have an honest conversation with our young people and say, listen, let's challenge the state, fight back, but be also very careful to study history to see what happened previously with individuals that did the same and what was the response of the state to just continue the same situation just in a different way. So most times people argue that the best way to change a system is to be a part of it, infiltrate the system and then make the difference. So for instance, President Biden has pledged to put a, a black woman in the Supreme Court. How can we as people of color, black people make or effect the change through the system. I, I, everyone I think, is going to be a Supreme Court judge. Correct. But, yes, correct. I think that that unfortunately, from a tactical perspective, and here, here I'm speaking in terms of military analysis, there's a danger when we only think it has to be one way. I think what we need to understand is that the challenge against racial discrimination and economic injustice requires a holistic approach to not just think that the only way is to 
change it through the system or inside the system. We actually need to understand, we have to envision to work and challenge it through and in it, but then outside of it. Because the problem is, unfortunately, history has shown us that a lot of the times individuals that start working in it or through it become co-opted by it, no? Or actually, the, depending on what historical period you're going to look at, there are systemic conditions that are much, much more broader than the individual, than the organization. And, and this, I would use the metaphor of an arrow, no? So, so the BLM, the various movements taking place, um, they, they might be at the tip of the arrow, but they're not the arrow. Oh, wow. Ooh. And I think, and I think that's one of the very, very critical understandings that we have to look at, no? And in the context of the US, uh, it depends realistically how honest do we think that US society is willing to, to change, but more importantly, not with just painting and positioning certain black individuals as the we have overcome and we have achieved success point. Because then if, if that's the case, then, then we're really mistaken. We're really mistaken. When you see what happened with George Floyd and uh, all the things that have happened, um, I always say this, my son always said, he had a feeling that African immigrants do not understand, you know, the challenges that African Americans have experienced. And so I really try to educate myself about the African American experience because I have a different experience. I come from a colonial experience, mm -hmm. which is also bad, but not the same, you know. I'm just thinking, we talk about, and then we see the Afro Latino or the, even just the, the, the Latino experience, forget even about Afro on that side. Mm -hmm. But when we think about how we unify, you know, when George Floyd was killed, people protested not because George Floyd, because he was the person. I think people saw the inhumanity and become, became a symbol. It symbolized the oppression that people have felt under the thumb of the police, of the system. Yet, we still continue to see ourselves as different. I see you, I see somebody of Cuban origin or descent differently from how I see someone from Nigeria and all of that, uh, or African-American. How valuable is it that we should work together and how can we begin to work together to, for our survival? Basically? Yes, so, so it is critical because one of the ways, and, 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 and what you are referring to is, is one of the pitfalls, if you will, that, that in academia we recognize as the limitations of identity politics. And what do I mean by that, no? It's like, so we have the African-Americans here, the Afro-Latinos here, the Latinos here, the Asian-Americans and so on and so forth. Here's part of the problem, part of the problem. <laughs> All the institutions and organizations are fighting for resources, whether those resources are from the federal government, from the state and or from private, you know, private spaces. So a lot of the times the very nature of that already pits individuals against others, no? So in other words, we see it as though if, if the African-American constituency is getting all of the resources, then the Latinos think that that means they're not getting any. And, and that's actually, that kind of paradigm is, is part of the problem, no? Part of the problem. How to combat that, it requires uh, 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 educational training for us to understand, first and foremost, we have to undo the interpretation that it has to be individual pockets of organizations fighting against each other to then progress. No, we have to understand that from the standpoint of those in power, we have to come together and understand that there's more strength in numbers, number one. Number two, understanding that if we start looking at, okay, well, how are African immigrants in the Bronx or in Atlanta surviving and what can we as African Americans help them in to make their material realities much better? And guess what? When we're having a rally, those very same African immigrants who may not work on a weekend, they can come and help us. And in that way, they can start learning about the history of African American oppression in the United States. And in that way, they start organically building links that are going to push the social situation forward. The problem is, quite honestly, we are in a society 
where it's a, we're always being told there has to be the complete opposite of that, mm -hmm. unfortunately. You know, it's funny you say that because as an African immigrant, I always find myself having a lot more in common with a Latino immigrant. Just the fact that we're immigrants. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, in, <laughs> in, and, indeed. Yeah, and then the African-American is thinking, I'm betraying my race, for example, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just so much. So we're not one thing as a sociologist, you know, we are not just one thing. Correct. And, and so the, the immigrant experience is, is highly, highly um, um, gravitational in that, as you mentioned, the experiences of French African or formerly French African territories coming to the US or British or Dutch in, in the case of Southern Africa and so forth, the immigrant experience, you go through, you go through everyday moments and experiences that, you, that, that bind you together. But the problem is once again, and this is, this is everyday realities, we're always trying to survive and we're always on a hamster cycle, just trying to just, you know, stay above water. That the other problem is, is that the, the, the rat race that we call about pushing forward, that, that never gives us the time to first and foremost think about how we're doing and then how to connect that to other ethnic communities that are going through the same thing, just in their own language or in their own ways. Unfortunately, there, there, and, and there is a particular taboo topic amongst the African-American community that sometimes is, is very, very sensitive and very fragile to understand, no? And, and that is the way that uh, immigrants, African-American communities, poor white, and then obviously those in power, the way we're conditioned to think in very US imperialistic ways and then understanding that just because you might be extremely anti-racist does not necessarily mean by default it makes you anti-capitalist or anti-elitist. And that has to be an internal discussion and sort of a, a, a analysis, no? Because you cannot be pro, 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 pro anti-racism and then at the same time adhere to very xenophobic or anti-immigratory po politics, no? Because it's a, it's a contradiction is a complete contradiction. And it's not just the African-American race. It happens a lot with second and third and fourth generation Latinos who they themselves five generations ago were immigrants. Mm -hmm. But in 2022, they buy into this very evil and anti-immigrant rhetoric against individuals that were themselves five generations ago. I That's sort of the, 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 the yeah. I've always wondered about that, Dr. Ortiz, because if I look at, especially, let's say, because the African immigrant, in the sense, we're still new per se. But when I look at the Latino community or the Asian immigrants, especially, or maybe the Caucasian immigrants also, right? There's a tendency. I found myself sometimes out there marching for my, let's say, a, a Latino parent is being deported or something, and I'm there. But then guess who's fighting? For them to be deported, sometimes it's their own community. Yes. yes and you yes. Know, is there a sense of feeling like this person is maybe maybe there's an emotional component to it that they feel like you are representing them poorly or something? I don't know what is what is it. No, I, I I would say it's, it's a number of things. Number one, if we look at the in terms of the hierarchy of racial groups, no, and no matter who you speak to, they might they may not want to admit it, but no matter where you go there is a racial hierarchy, no? Now, whether you want to admit it or not, that's a different conversation. <laughs> but th the reality is that a lot of the times, it, individuals that are not at the bottom, but close to the bottom, never want to really be able, want, want to be pushed down to those who are quite close to them. So they make it a very, very, very strong adamant point to always push themselves away from those who are so close to them in terms of that hierarchy, number one. Number two, they're brainwashed by the system to buy into these very xenophobic ideas because once again, that's what keeps people from coming together. It makes no sense why you should have Mexican Americans in Los Angeles being the ones on the front lines 
calling for the deportation of Mexican immigrants when again, they themselves were their foreparents four generations ago, no? It happens in the African-American community. It happens in the Spanish Caribbean community, no? And I would say, depending on the historical period, also within the white community as well. Mm -hmm. you no, know, remember the ways that 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 Protestant whites treated the Irish and yeah. the early moments of the Italians. You no, know? it, it was it was literally whites discriminating against what they considered ethnic lesser white in that period. Isn't that just funny? That thank you for clarifying this because um, the last election, and I always say this, you know, for me elections. I don't know if they really speak true to what our society is going through because I'm always kind of like for women's issues, immigration. And then I'll see people that are my same race or people that I know we are <laughs> enduring the same oppression. And they're on the side that is saying everything against what I need, everything against our immigration and, and, and the things that we should be supporting because you would think if we were united, right? It should be a landslide who we, elect based on our survival um unfortunately one of the wake-up calls that i had was looking at the reality that neither the african community or the african diaspora or the latino community is monolithic in terms of his thinking and in terms of his political agenda right um but the the system i would also argue does a very good job of conditioning people to to, to not only uh, hate themselves, no, and I, and I hear I bring you to the attention of the Martinican psychologist Franz Fanon, no, in his famous book *The Wretched of the Earth*, *The mm -hmm. Dame de la Telle*, no, mm -hmm. uh, where where he sees that that the colonial subjects, there are individuals who become so embedded in the in terms of colonial ideology that they hate themselves, and that by the very same notion, they hate their fellow brother, their fellow sister, their fellow brethren, and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, once we get into the psychosis of that. That's very difficult to deal with. The other component to that too is that right now we are living in a world, I would argue, that people have less time to really say, okay, I'm gonna work with this person to, to teach them, to have them think differently, no? Because right now everybody is in survival mode. Everybody is in, okay, I gotta make sure I'm okay, that my immediate family is okay. And I think unfortunately that's one of the moments where the system has the upper hand uh, against us. but. Um, there are moments when, when we can have those very matter of fact conversations, uh, but then you have to put them into practice and consistently put them into practice. So Dr. Ortiz, is there any solution for this? Because these are just challenges, 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 challenges. Mm. How do we turn it around? Um, first and foremost, I think we have to start with the youth, no? So one of the very first things I would always would argue is you got to be in touch with the youth. If, if you are in a movement or you are part of an organization and there's no young people, then you're basically just uh, wasting time. Because the reality is the more the, we have to pass the baton to those behind us, but it has to be lit. It has to be on fire. You no, know? a lot of the times, too, we have to learn. We have to learn their language. Hmm. We as the older generations have to say, listen, I'm sorry I failed you. Here I am, let's learn from each other, but also I'm gonna guide you so you can learn from me what I failed in so you don't commit the same mistakes. Um, I, would, I, I don't like uh, beating around the bush or sugarcoating things. I would argue that we are living in very, um, very unequal times. And I think that right now we as African people need to be very careful that we pay attention to um, how this is changing. I'll be bluntly honest with you, I'm not sure what's gonna be the next form of control that's being imposed regionally and domestically or internationally, but the, the system is in a crisis. And I mean that locally, regionally, domestically, and globally, by all means. You know, it's true because if we don't educate our youth, and I'm curious to know what we should educate them about, because if we don't educate our youth, they become that second and third, fourth generation that we're just talking about, Mm -hmm. who are removed from the experiences of the originals that came to the United States. So if I don't educate my children, if I, if I shield them, don't teach them what my struggles are, then they don't have any knowledge to pass on to their children and so on and so forth. Hence the desensitization. I would mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, 
it's a it's a triple burden. It's a triple burden in the sense that we understand that if we as either immigrants ourselves or parents of immigrants, we understand that education is one of the fastest ways to be able to move up the ladder, if you will, no? But the reality is that the mainstream education is completely either ahistorical or very racist or extremely misogynist, no? So we have to tell our children, listen, you have to go to school and excel but you also have to know that there's another version of that knowledge and of that history. And you must perfect and master not only the mainstream one that they want you to, to know to pass that test, to get that scholarship, to then go on to that institution, and you, and you learn repeatedly how to do that, but it doesn't stop there. Then you got to come back, and here comes the, the double burden. Then you got to come back, and you have to learn who is Ruben Niobe. You have to learn who is Amilka Cabral. You have to learn the radical history of what is not considered mainstream. So we always get the typical numbers, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, not, but we don't get about Malcolm X. We don't talk about the Deacons for, Dep the Deacons for Defense and Robert Williams. So that's the double burden. But then the triple burden is what happens, Madame, for example, in your case, if you tell your son, excel in mainstream educational material, but you're also going to demonstrate to me, you know very well, anti-colonial African history in the Cameroon. But then he comes and tells you, well, listen, mom, I, I mastered both, but I'm making a conscious decision to only stick with one. And the one he's choosing is the one that is not part of anti-colonial history. What do you do now? What should I do? Yeah, well, and but until then it becomes an issue of self-choice but that self-choice has a cost yeah and that self-choice means that then if he were to do that the cultural connection to understanding the commonalities of african peoples around the world eventually gets diluted and diluted and it gets lost and unfortunately i would argue to a certain extent that we can easily see that in the context of the ways in which and this this is du bois and other scholars as well early ethnic whites in the US were invited to becoming fully white by particularly engaging in that particular erasure of their cultural heritage about where they're coming from. But at the same time, buying into US notions of how to be racist towards African Americans. Wow. You know something though, we were talking and I was feeling so challenged, but when you started talking about how we should partition education with our youth. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the majority, I don't think many would be, uh, many young people would be the, the, would take the option of not learning and making the right choice. There will always be some exceptions to the rule, but I, I have a feeling that if we did educate them, follow your mainstream education, however, you need to demonstrate knowledge of such and such and such based depending on the various uh, cultures that we come from. I think it could make a difference. And that is something that most of us have not been told. Most of us are in the rat race. We're just trying to survive. And we've embraced this Western educational system, mm -hmm. even the religion. Religion is another tool. The yes. religion, <laughs> and the, which has miseducated us profusely, right? And that's what we're following. And now we're just confused. We just so, so 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 there, there's always uh, unfortunately the the Western system does a very good job of brainwashing individuals to only think that the Western way of education or thinking or and even, even worshiping yeah or even worshiping is the only way that exists and that that is a huge huge uh, uh, catastrophic you know condition but then those individuals who are aware that we have to create and maintain a parallel vernacular that challenges the dominant rhetoric. It's not that we have to allow our children to become perfect Western subjects. No, we have to teach them, listen, this is what you need to learn to be able to excel and accomplish that mission, but it does not stop there. You have a cultural duty, you have an African obligation to also know 
who were your foreparents and what is your role in this African journey to move your people forward? The, and, but it's, it's not an easy call. It's not an easy call. And on top of that, it's not a half off, half on. This is a permanent full-time journey because you cannot begin and stop, begin and stop because then you're really doing more damage than actually pushing forward. You know, I always, I always hear from the Jewish community how mm -hmm. they always send their children back to Israel. Yes. Yeah. So they're already doing it. That's what you're advocating for. We do it essentially through education. Yes, and, and education, and but it's at the, I say it boils down to, to making sure you identify very clearly, very adamantly, what is going to be the practice of culture that you're going to retain in terms of being able to look at who you are. And if you ask, for example, whether it's African American or Latinos, the question is, are we seeing our generations now getting closer or more away from their culture. Because if, if, if we retain the cultural practice, but then going back to you the other question as well, we have to be very weary of the limitations of only seeing it through culture. Because culture has also been used to oppress African-Americans and to oppress Latinos in the United States. So it requires a fine balance to understand the game for what it is and also hold down to the notion that we have to always not accept what we're being told. How much does representation influence this? Because um, I just remember when they had Black Panther, the movie, Black yes. Panther, you know, it kind of made people of African descent feel a sense of pride and people started wanting to identify. Now my kids wanted to wear the African attire that I've been wanting them to wear and they always felt embarrassed to even put on. <laughs> You know, now African kids are trying to wear the shirt. They want to look African. They even want to say, I'm such and such. Even though they were born here, they're kind of, I'm Cameroonian American. I'm Nigerian American. They started to embrace that because of something that made, gave them a sense of pride. So how much does that kind of representation help and that we, should we foster that? So, so there, it, there was a, she actually just passed away not too long ago. You no, know, um, a very, very famous and powerful scholar by the name of Bell Hooks, no? She was, her legal name was Gloria Watkins, no? But an amazing cultural theorist, feminist, black feminist scholar, no? And one of her texts called Black Looks, um, she argues that the US media and representation, every single part of US media, and that includes movies, the whole gamut of media, is based on the reproduction and continued reproduction of white supremacy and whiteness, no? And that has to be broken down. At the same time, uh, I can share with you that there's been some really fierce pro and anti Black Panther critiques about to what extent is it really erasing the history of the Black Panther Party the radical history of the Black Panther Party in the U.S., where now you make this into a sort of Hollywoodish, animated, and sort of you know completely a historical representation of Black Panther, right? But then you look at the other side of that, and you look at the cultural impact and the cultural empowerment that it has onto young boys and young girls then that also has some validity to it. How do you juxtapose both of those becomes a much more difficult conversation because again, my conversations with some of the original founding members of the party are saying, wait a second, this is just another way that US history looks to erase the radical nature of black and African resistance in this country. And it's not just with African-Americans. So that unfortunately it, it's, is, is a very, uh, not complicated, but just multifaceted uh, uh, discussion. Wow, we couldn't finish this conversation in an hour if we would <laughs> <laughs> But I'm so happy you gave us some last words of wisdom about how we go about surviving in this environment, coming here as immigrants and you know, becoming a fabric of this 
society, which most of us are not going to go back home because like you mm -hmm. said, when we go back home, we're not fully what we left. Yes, yes. Recognized. So how do we straddle and how do we survive? So I, I think first and foremost is, is, is being able to, to sit down and look at, okay, we came for this country, we came to this country to better our material reality. We came to this country to push our generations forward. And that is a very serious mission and one that one does not play with. However, at the same time, we have to be cognizant to know that we cannot let go of focusing on who we are culturally, but in ways that don't necessarily go in line with what mainstream ideology wants us to believe and think. And I would even add another point to that is you can push yourself materially and push your family to, to move up and, and gain financial, uh, uh, um, financial accumulation, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to buy in into imperialist ideologies and you gotta be always cognizant to check yourself. And that's part of the problem because if, if we really look at it, how much of culture in the United States is not defined by the people, but is defined by systems that actually want us to celebrate our culture the way they think we should celebrate. You know what, those are the best words, I've, last words I've heard. We need to check ourselves. Yes, and continuously check ourselves because the, the, the point of the matter is, is if we don't, then by default, little by little, we become those very same African-Americans that are very xenophobic against African immigrants or those very same Mexican-Americans who are highly xenophobic against Mexican immigrants when once again, we were them four generations ago. So why all of a sudden you're espousing such xenophobic beliefs towards them when that is your grandmother just simply four generations ago? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz. Pleasure. Uh, it's been quite a riveting conversation, but I'm sure our audience would like to know how they can reach you or read your works. There's so much to be learned from, from you and I would love give us some prescriptions of where to find this kind of great information. Yes, uh, so I can, uh, I can share with you, Madame, uh, my email address, and then you can forward on to your listeners. Um, um, or, and also, I'm currently working on two manuscripts. Uh, one is focusing on penal regimes in the world economy, and then the other one's on slavery in Cuba in the 19th century. Uh, those are soon to be um, out. Um, and then, again, um, I, as you know, I teach at Harvard University in Washington, D.C., uh, so they can also look me up at the Howard Sociology and Criminology Department as well. Thank you so much. Great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for spending this time with us. I'm sure it's empowered us. It would empower them. I have been empowered. I feel like you've given me a tool. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much and come back again, please. My, my pleasure. Anytime. Take care now. Take care, Doc. Take care. Bye. Have a good day. Goodbye. We've come to the end of our show. I hope you enjoyed it. And if so, Please share your opinions with me in the comment section or send me an email at publisher at immigrantmagazine.com. I hope that you subscribe and invite others to subscribe to this new and revolutionary channel, Team TV, Voice of Immigrants in America. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Pam and Chang and like us on Facebook, The Immigrant Magazine. See you next time on Immigrant Magazine Weekly.